Hi, everyone, and welcome to the histamine detection in tuna using hyperspectral imaging webinar. My name is Marissa DuPont. I am the marketing specialist. This webinar is being recorded and should be available for viewing within 48 hours. We will answer as many of your questions live as possible. Additional questions will be answered by email after the conclusion of this webinar, and you can send questions to marketing at headwallphotonics.com. Uh, if you have questions, please use the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel on your PC or phone. You can see where those are located on your screen. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists, William Rock, PhD, who is Applications Manager here at Headwall, and George Killian, who is Applications Scientist here at Headwall. And now I will turn it over to Will. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Marissa. Uh, so I'd like to start off this webinar with a brief introduction to uh, Headwall Photonics. Headwall Photonics uh, has been in business since 2003 and was recently acquired by Arsenal Capital Partners. We're headquartered in Bolton, Massachusetts, and we have two other locations in Massachusetts and another location in the Netherlands. Uh, Headwall Photonics employs around 100 highly skilled employees and is ISO 9001 certified. Uh, across the different sites, Headwall has around 40,000 square feet of in, uh, engineering and manufacturing facilities, and we serve a large global customer base across our core markets. Uh, and we serve um, three uh, product groups serve these core markets uh, that I will go over on the next slide. So the three main business areas uh, that Headwall serves are machine vision, remote sensing, and optical components and assemblies. The, uh, Headwall is a leading supplier of hyperspectral imaging solutions used for machine vision and remote sensing applications. And uh, Headwall specializes in manufacturing optical components and assemblies, such as diffraction gratings, spectrometers, and spectrographs uh, that are sold to OEMs and, or to end users. Uh, so the machine vision product line, which is the main focus of this webinar, because we're focusing on a machine vision application uh, in the histamine detection of tuna, um, uh, it includes um, hyperspectral systems and software that are sold to emerging industrial uh, automation applications like uh, food processing, uh, healthcare, and to the consumer market. Uh, the, then a remote sensing uh, and a remote sensing products are uh, generally sold for uh, spectral classifications of objects, materials, and natural formations uh, in applications that are uh, including earth monitoring, agriculture, and mining. So just briefly about our uh, remote sensing product lines, uh, those can be sold as airborne hyperspectral payloads that can be integrated by the end user onto uh, an, either a drone or a manned aircraft. Uh, and Headwall also sells turnkey UAV hyperspectral packages uh, that can be unboxed and flown to collect hyperspectral data the day they uh, arrive on your doorstep. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, our, our recommended path to go is to uh, let Headwall take care of all the fuss for you and uh, give you a package that can be unboxed and used on day one. Uh, other um, our optical components and assemblies products include uh, holographics, replicated gratings, waveguides, and micro lens arrays. Uh, so now we're going to go over in a little more detail on our machine vision product line. Uh, as you can see on this slide, here are um, three examples of machine vision products. Uh, on the far left, you can see the MVC Denier. Uh, which is the smallest and lightest sensor in its class. Uh, it covers what we call the V-near or visible near-infrared spectral range, spanning 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Uh, and it provides high spatial and spectral resolution, uh, USB 3.1 connectivity. Uh, and so th this sensor is um, sold generally along with our uh, computing and software packages to give you uh, a a full end-to-end -end solution. In the middle, you can see uh, Headwall's Hyperspec MVC NEAR, uh, which is a NEAR solution, and uh, Headwall defines the NEAR infrared spectral range as 900 to 1700 nanometers. Uh, and this is an affordable solution, especially designed for machine vision applications uh, 
requiring the near infrared spectral range. It comes with gigabit ethernet connectivity and also has a small form factor. Uh, and on the far right, you can see our award-winning VNIR hyperspectral imaging system. Uh, so the MVX is, uh, provides hyperspectral imaging and onboard processing all in one box. Uh, and the box also comes with uh, ingress protection uh, to help for easy deployment in challenging environments. Uh, so a few of the key applications that are uh, can be addressed using hyperspectral imaging uh, for machine vision include color consistency, nut sorting, meat grading, and fruit grading. And so this table uh, will show you the products that are most applicable to those different uh, applications um, and in general uh, what is desired by those different applications as well. Uh, so for color consistency measurements, uh, generally a, a COTS product is used uh, and can be used for uh, QA, QC, or quality assurance uh, measurements that can uh, help ensure that the color of your product line remains consistent. Um, the nut sorting application, uh, you can see uh, a, a real example of a deployed nut sorting application if you visit our website. Um, and so th this is a, a common use for hyperspectral imaging um, because uh, hyperspectral imaging can allow you to differentiate very similar uh, looking items such as nuts and shells and other common form materials seen in nuts such as barks and t uh, sticks and twigs and things um, that can be hard to differentiate from the good nut product in uh, using just a standard uh, RGB camera. Uh, meat grading is another um, powerful application for hyperspectral imaging, a great, uh, a great example of that. You'll see in detail later with the um, uh, grading or um, histamine detection on tuna. Uh, it can also be used for things like fat to lean measurements or grading of other meat products as well. Um, and, and fruit grading is another um, application that uh, hyperspectral imaging can be deployed for as well. Uh, including measurements of the, the ripeness of fruit, detection of uh, softness or bruising in fruit that might not be visible uh, to the naked eye or to an RGB camera, or, or also the non-contact prediction of the sweetness of fruit, or which is uh, commonly referred to as the, the measurement of the bricks. Um, so now I, I would like to hand over the, uh, uh, the floor to my colleague George who will give you a brief introduction to hyperspectral imaging so you have uh, some background before we dive into the TUNA application. Thanks, Will. So for those that are unfamiliar with hyperspectral imaging, allow me to give you just a quick explanation and how it can be applied for machine vision. First, hyperspectral imaging combines the spatial information that we get from a regular image with the chemical discrimination of spectroscopy. It creates a powerful measurement technique. Hyperspectral imaging sensors, such as the MVX and MVC VNIR we mentioned earlier, gathers information from over hundreds of spectral bands for each spatial pixel in the image, and that data is stay stored in a data cube. If you consider the image on the left of your screen of the parrots, the hyperspectral image of the same scene would return a stack of images for each wavelength within that range, creating the data cube. Hyperspectral imaging offers an advantage over multispectral imaging of the same scene because it gives us a wider range of the spectral pattern of each of the different uh, pixels within that image. Now, there are lots of different types of hyperspectral images. Imagers, uh, Hydewell utilizes a push broom sensor or a line scanner. Uh, so how do we, our sensors collect that information? Well, if we imagine we're flying a drone over a coastline like the image on the left, uh, a snapshot camera of that scene would simply collect a 2D array with columns and rows of the uh, pixels within that scene. Our uh, push broom uh, line scanners collect a thin scan uh, line of pixels and move across the scene, building that image step by step. For machine vision, we do the same thing. Instead of moving the sensor over the scene, we move the scene beneath the sensor where we collect a line and line of pixels of the object beneath. In this case, it might be tuna. 
or uh, we and then we build uh, all of those pixels together to get uh, the the overall spectral pattern of the uh, scene beneath. And then we can take all that great data, capture it, analyze it, and create a, uh, a classification model or other different kinds of models that we can employ on the line. So hopefully that gave you a little bit better understanding of hyperspectral imaging, and I'll pass it back to Will so he can go into the uh, tuna histamine study that we did here at Edwall. All right, thank you very much, George. Uh, so I'd like to start off the section on the, the tuna histamine study with a, a brief motivation for why it's important to measure the histamine levels in uh, certain fish, including tuna. Uh, so when histamine is present on tuna, it can cause illness, and uh, it is a toxin that is produced by bacteria uh, on the surface of the fish. So this toxin can't be cooked away from, uh, from the fish, so once it's there, it's going to make you sick. And so it's very important to not allow the toxin to develop on the fish, and in most cases, the toxin develops because the fish isn't properly stored. Uh, so, like most bacteria, uh, its growth is promoted in temperatures, uh, in warmer, say, uh, closer to room temperature environments, and it really increases if you warm the room up to like 90 Fahrenheit or say uh, 30 C or so. Uh, so, it's very important to store the fish properly to prevent the formation of histamine, um, and once the histamine is there, you can't just cook it away. Uh, and, and so it's um, very important to be able to measure and ensure that you have high quality fish uh, and that those fish don't have uh, illness causing histamine toxin on them. Um, and it, it, the FDA also advises that the formation of histamine uh, can and uh, often is non-uniform uh, throughout the, the entire piece of fish. And so they actually give some guidelines on where you should sample the fish when you're um, uh, measuring the histamine level, uh, because all of the standard protocols used to measure histamine uh, include spot samples. So you take a little chunk of the histamine off of it, you move it to a laboratory, uh, you do some chemical tests on uh, that piece of tuna, that, uh, of course, you're, and then you're only getting a histamine measurement for one spot, and you're destroying the sample uh, that you're getting the, the histamine measurement from. Um, so those are, uh, uh, that is the, the accepted way to, to measure tuna histamine, and uh, those are all things that could be improved with hyperspectral imaging uh, that could provide a, a non-destructive and um, uh, all-inclusive measurement of uh, the histamine level on the surface of the tuna. Uh, so Briefly, uh, what did we do in this uh, tuna histamine study? Um, so 15 raw tuna steaks were measured using a headwall veneer hyperspectral imaging sensor on a scanning stage. Uh, so this is much like the image that uh, George showed on the previous slide. Uh, we had tuna steaks passing underneath the sensor, uh, gathering the full veneer hyperspectral data. Veneers, again, visible in the infrared, covering 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Um, the histamine levels were measured on seven of those 15 tuna steaks uh, using a neogen, uh, neogen Veritox assay. Uh, or again, like I briefly explained before, a spot sample was taken uh, from the tuna, so some of the tuna was cut off, taken back to a laboratory, and run through this standard assay uh, to get a prediction level for, uh, of the uh, histamine parts per million on that piece of tuna. Um, some of the, uh, just a little bit of bookkeeping, some of the larger tuna steaks required two scans because they were uh, quite big. So that's why when I show uh, some of the data scans later, you'll see uh, some of them broken into two, um, uh, or you'll see maybe more uh, dots on my graph than the seven. Um, and uh, also another bit of bookkeeping, uh, the, the histamine or our histamine regression model was built uh, using the uh, Perclass Mira software package. Uh, and so over the next set of slides, I will uh, give you a, a brief summary of how that model was built. But to avoid burying the lead, these are the results of that model. Um, so the plot that I'm showing here uh, is a plot of the predicted uh, histamine value versus the measured histamine value. 
Uh, so a perfect model would fall perfectly along that black line. So it just would form a, a perfect line there. Um, but this plot demonstrates that uh, there is absolutely a correlation that we can measure uh, between the binear hyperspectral data and the measured uh, histamine value on the tuna. Uh, so there's some important nuance in that language that I use, the correlation. So uh, hyperspectral imaging is an indirect measurement technique, uh, meaning that there is nothing uh, inherent about um, the hyperspectral data that says uh, this is the absolute measure of the histamine. We need to train it with uh, known ground truth methods that can directly measure the histamine content, such as the, the assays that were used. Um, so we are correlating spectral signatures to uh, known measured uh, histamine values. Um, this particular model is also just a demonstration of uh, what could be done and, and was done on a, a fairly um, small sample size. So you can see there are nine dots on the graph uh, generated from uh, seven different tuna steaks. And uh, there were uh, nine dots on the graph because some of the very large tunas were measured in two pieces. And, and so they were uh, two different tuna objects. Um, and uh, also the, the robustness and uh, of this model uh, should be tested with a larger data set that uh, is not included in um, uh, the model development. And Headwall would be very excited to work with a motivated partner uh, to develop a, a robust and deployable solution uh, if uh, the real-time screening of the histamine level on tuna interests you, uh, please contact us and uh, we'd be excited to work with you. Uh, so how are, uh, or how is a regression model built using the PERC-class mirror software? And more specifically, how did we build this uh, tuna histamine level uh, regression model? Um, and, and so before I get uh, into my explanation here, uh, I just want to also note that if you want uh, more detailed explanations or uh, to see more of the features uh, that can be uh, deployed using PERCLAS Mira, uh, please visit their website, PERCLAS.com, and they have a whole series of training and tutorial uh, videos uh, that you can peruse at your leisure uh, to get more details and, uh, again, uh, see a wider variety of different applications. Uh, so a regression model is built. Um, and through a series of steps. The first step is to create a classification model, which will uh, assign a class to every spatial pixel uh, in your image. Um, so I, I always use the language spatial pixel and spectral pixel because we're creating a hyperspectral data cube um, where in one axis you have all of your spatial information, the other axis you have your spectral information. So that's just the, the common language that we often use is talking about a, a spatial pixel is just one spot on that image. Um, and a spectral pixel would be uh, the intensity at one spectral value. Uh, or I could often uh, talk about the spectrum at uh, a single spatial pixel. Um, so the first step is to uh, produce a classification where we group every spatial pixel into a certain class. In this particular model, we created a four class model uh, where in the dark blue you see the background. So of course we don't want to uh, include the, the belt in our model and so that's uh, uh, classified as, as a background signal. There's the tuna which we're actually using to build our regression model on and then there are a couple of other classes that appear on the tuna that we want to exclude from our regression modeling uh, that are uh, the, some of the shadowed pieces at the side and also uh, the marble, the, the fat uh, bit in the tuna. And some of the gray pixels that you might see in there are unclassified pixels. Um, and so I, I did not include that in the color key, um, but the unclassified pixels include things like glare uh, where the, the spectral data uh, is not as reliable when you're getting glare pixels back into the sensor. And so those are uh, excluded from the regression model as well. Um, so again, step one is build the classification model. From the classification model, uh, and we um, recognize objects. And from the objects, we will uh, build a regression model. Um, and so, uh, again, on this first slide, 
we can see uh, an RGB image on the left and a per pixel classification uh, on the right. Uh, and in that per pixel classification, every single pixel in the image is assigned to a class, either background, tuna, shadow, or fat. And you see that dash F on the tuna, that means the tuna is the only class that is placed into the foreground, meaning that is the only class that an object is formed from. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about objects on the next slide. Um, so on these two images, on the left, you see the per pixel classification image from the previous slide. And on the right, you see the object image. Uh, so after we identify every pixel in the scene, uh, or, or after we classify every pixel in the scene, we will separate um, groups of classified pixels into objects. So a contiguous area of uh, pixels classified as tuna will be recognized as a tuna object. Uh, I might interchangeably use the word tuna steak because essentially what I want to do is build an agro algorithm that first finds the tuna steak. And once you find the tuna steak, you can assign a regression value to that tuna steak. Uh, so by default, per class mirror regression models operate on the object level. Uh, so that means you will find objects uh, in your data stream. So if you have a whole bunch of tuna steaks moving by in your conveyor belt, um, every time a, a tuna would pass under your sensor, you would recognize it as an object, and then your regression model would si assign uh, a regression value to that entire tuna object. And so each object would get one regression value, uh, representing the um, uh, average histamine content for that entire tuna steak. Uh, and so, again, that is the uh, standard way to deploy a regression model in, in per class Mira. Uh, so on the next slide, I will show uh, some pretty neat images that can be generated by these regression models as well. Uh, so, again, uh, when you're, it's important to note that the, the um, when you're deploying a regression model, the standard way is to produce one regression value per object. Um, another accessible output is uh, the per pixel regression values. Uh, so this can provide a heat map of uh, the, the predicted histamine value um, uh, on a, a given tuna steak. Uh, and so in this case, I showed uh, one heat map from what ended up being a um, medium histamine level uh, piece of tuna, and another heat map from uh, a tuna that had a, a high histamine uh, content. And so on the far right, you can see my color scale that goes uh, from zero ppm is the dark purple, and 200 ppm is uh, the bright yellow. Uh, and, and so that can orient you a little bit on uh, what this image looks like. Uh, and so this is just demonstrating that you could return a heat map of um, the estimated um, uh, uh, regression values uh, across the whole uh, tuna steak if you are worried about finding hot spots uh, uh, on a given tuna. Uh, but again, the, the standard mode of deployment is to get an average regression value for uh, each whole piece of tuna that would uh, allow you to screen every piece of tuna instantly as it's passing uh, under your belt uh, to get its histamine content. Um, so now if we could go on to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so how do you go from training a model, like I went over previously, the, the steps for training a regression model are create a classifier, um, segment out objects from that classifier, assign regression values to the objects uh, in that classifier, um, and so that's all uh, depicted by the, the left image, going from uh, collecting the training data, downloading the data, and creating the model. And then the right image uh, shows a, a cartoon of deploying that. Um, so after you've created a model, um, it can be deployed on a product like the MGX that has real-time processing, um, where as the, the tuna or whatever your product is, is passing underneath the hyperspectral imager, um, the classification model is working in real time and outputting results, uh, in, uh, again, instantly that can either be sent to something like a picking robot. So uh, the, say you wanted to eject the bad tuna, you, you could send the information to a robot to, to pick it, 
or uh, to a database or the cloud or somewhere. So uh, say your goal was to um, separate the tuna or grade the tuna based on the histamine level. Uh, you could just record the data somewhere uh, to allow you to assign a grade or a value uh, to the tuna as it goes down the line. And, and of course, you can visualize how this could be used for other applications. If your application is to detect foreign materials from your product line, you could uh, send the location of the foreign materials to the picking robot and uh, it could pick the foreign materials out as well. Um, some of the, the big advantages, especially in the case of uh, tuna histamine, is this uh, would provide you instant and rapid uh, instant feedback to allow you to uh, enact rapid corrective action. Uh, so rather than taking a chunk out of your tuna, taking it back to a lab, running an assay, and then getting a result, uh, you can get instant feedback on the predicted histamine level in your tuna. And if you're all of a sudden getting uh, a, a bunch of tuna that's um, uh, measuring high histamine content, you can quick, rapidly um, uh, correct your process, find the root cause of uh, these elevated histamine levels, uh, and, and fix it without delay. Um, another big advantage is that it allows 100% screening uh, to help eliminate 100%, uh, I should uh, be careful and say surface screening, because uh, hyperspectral imaging is a surface measurement um, uh, of the product line to uh, avoid errors that come about due to spot sampling. So just taking a small bit of tuna from a subset of the tuna uh, stakes that are going down the line. Uh, instead, hyperspectral imaging would allow you uh, to image the, the full product line uh, as it is going by. Um, so, uh, to summarize again this uh, tuna histamine application, we were able to see in our initial studies a correlation between the venier hyperspectral data and histamine levels on raw tuna. Uh, now these initial tests are very promising, uh, but of course more data is needed to determine the robustness of this model. Um, and uh, per-class MIRA software was used to create the regression models here. Uh, if you want to know more about the per-class MIRA software and it, uh, other ways to apply it, uh, please visit the, the website perclus.com. Um, and uh, this model uh, could be used to predict histamine levels on raw tuna in real time as they are uh, passing under the sensor on the conveyor. And uh, again, to reiterate, uh, Head will be very excited to work with a partner uh, to develop a, a, a real solution to screen uh, a raw tuna for histamine content. Um, it, it, uh, to help um, both uh, guarantee the quality of tuna and keep consumers safe. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to continue on with a, a short demonstration uh, showing how uh, we go from collecting raw data to training the raw data in per-class MIRA to deploying a classification model all within uh, the same software package. So uh, a, a very seamless transition from data collection to uh, data training to a model deployment uh, via the per-class MIRA software uh, package. And so uh, please enjoy this short demonstration. Thanks, Will. Now that you've seen how to build a regression model on per-class MIRA, Allow me to take a second to show you how we can build a classification model in per class Miro. Not only can we gather data, classify that data, but we can then deploy that classification model in real time. We're going to be using today the MVC VNIR sensor. You can note it's quite compact design, but it's still very powerful and able to gather spectral data from a range of 400 to 1,000 nanometers. To simulate what you might be deploying our MVC VNIR or other systems on, we have a small conveyor belt with some pieces of plastic fish with an illumination device as well. So I'm going to be going to the per-class mirror software and showing you how we build and deploy those classification models. Now we're going to build a classification model in the per-class mirror software and see it deployed in real time. First, we're going to start with a scan. Here we have a scan of some of the plastic fish samples we saw earlier. We're going to create some different classes, class for the background, a label, 
some samples we're going to label as good and some samples that we're going to be labeling as bad. To label these different classes, we're going to paint the pixels of interest within the scene and match them to that particular class. As you can see, I've painted some of the pixels of the background blue, the good fish green, and some of the bad fish samples red. We then can click model search and the per class mirror software will find a model and then we'll employ that model onto this image that we have on the screen. It will make a classification for each of the pixels in the scene. Furthermore, the per class mirror will be able to find contiguous regions of similar pixels and label them as objects. Both the decisions and objects can be displayed in real time. Here we have some of those plastic samples of fish moving by. And we can see that the per class mirror software identifies the different pixels in real time and assigns them to the different classes, but also can find objects within the scene and classify them in real time as well. Now we're going to have our Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please post them in the questions area. Um, so we'll start with, would this work for fish other than tuna? Uh, I can take that one. And I also just want to note uh, this graphic on the background of uh, the Q&A section. Uh, are the per pixel regression classifications of all, all the tuna steaks that were measured during this product? Or, or during this uh, uh, project. And uh, so you can see all of the different um, uh, tuna steaks that we measured and uh, their per pixel classifications here. So please enjoy that image during the Q&A session. Uh, so to answer the question, could this work for uh, other fish? Uh, yes, in general, you could um, create a, a model for, um, uh, another fish, uh, specifically you say another fish that um, is prone to develop histamine content. The, the careful thing to note is that, uh, again, hyperspectral imaging is uh, an indirect, me uh, indirect measurement that requires, or uh, that's showing a correlation between uh, the hyperspectral data and uh, the measured result. Uh, and so a specific model would be, uh, need to be made for uh, whatever other target uh, you want to uh, measure. So a tuna model would not work for salmon or grouper or uh, another fish. You would need a model specific uh, to that raw fish. And I guess just to go one small step further, um, this was a raw tuna model. This would also not work on cooked tuna. Because uh, again, the, once you cook the tuna, you're going to greatly change the spectral signature of that tuna and uh, the model was built on uh, uh, correlating to measurements of uh, the surface of raw tuna. What is the max line rate in Hertz of your hyperspectral imaging sensors at full spectral and spatial resolutions? Uh, so that depends on the sensor. Um, so for the full spectral and spatial resolution of the Venier sensor, um, I, I believe it is 400 hertz. Um, the the MVC near, uh, I guess I, I I know that it's faster than that. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I you could find all that information on our website or on our data sheets. Uh, I would just uh, also like to note that um, the most important thing isn't necessarily how fast the sensor can go at full spatial and spectral resolution. Uh, but how fast the sensor can uh, accomplish your task. Um, so for most of these uh, final deployed solutions, we're not using uh, the full spectral range uh, of the sensor, and, and we can often optimize it to be uh, a, a truncated spectral range that can operate at um, uh, faster frame rates. Uh, and, and of course, um, there is some computational overhead required for um, uh, deploying a model. Uh, so it, it's important to know the, the deployed speed of the final solution 
uh, and Headwall uh, is very happy to work uh, with customers to help you develop a, a solution end to end um, and uh, help you develop uh, a, a model that will work at your required speeds for your required spatial resolutions. Um, and, and so if you have um, a, a specific application in mind, please contact us and uh, we will do our best to uh, uh, serve your needs. How would packaging like shrink wrap affect the results? I can take this one. Um, so uh, the benefit of using hyperspectral imaging is that we can of course uh, scan the scene if there was shrink wrap on the tuna, but the important thing to remember is that this particular model that we built was built for raw tuna that didn't have any shrink wrap uh, over the tuna itself. So if you were to try to employ this current model, you likely wouldn't have any good results, uh, but the, bene the, the beauty of it is that if you were to create a model with shrink wrap uh, and you were still to ground truth the tuna to use uh, the chemical assays to determine the concentration of the histamine on the surface, you would still likely be able to build a very uh, good regression model just like we did uh, with this study as well. Can you train a model from multiple images or do all classes and objects have to be present in one image for training? Uh, no, you can train from multiple images. In fact, this model was created uh, for multiple images. Uh, so uh, you can load uh, any number of images into per class mirror simultaneously, um, and you can uh, assign regression values uh, per object on each image. So you could have one image with many objects, you could have many images with many objects, or you could have many images with one object each. Um, uh, all of those ways of collecting data um, are compatible with per class Mira and can be used to develop a regression model. What is the lowest PPM it can detect? Uh, so we can't answer that question. Um, this, in, in this particular case, uh, we measured tuna anywhere from uh, the range of say 10 to 15 PPM up to 200 PPM. Um, but we did not do um, uh, careful robustness testing to know um, just how accurately it, it can measure uh, all of those PPM levels. Um, and so I, I guess maybe the, uh, a slightly different question would be how precisely could it measure the, um, uh, the parts per million of the histamine? And, and, and again, that, and so this model, uh, could produce results all the way down to zero ppm. It, it would just predict that the results are zero ppm. Um, and how um, precise that answer is uh, it would require a, a bit more robustness testing. Um, but based on our early results, uh, we were correlating quite strongly uh, to our ground truth. Uh, and, and that's, of course, another important thing to note uh, is that. Um, the accuracy of our uh, uh, indirect method is limited by the accuracy of uh, our ground truth. Um, and in this case, we took one bit of tuna from a whole tuna steak and used that to assign a uniform uh, histamine level for that entire tuna steak. A, a follow-up study uh, could be done where we measure a tuna and then take multiple samples from that and train uh, based on multiple different localized regions uh, to possibly create a, uh, a, a model with higher uh, accuracy or higher precision. Um, but again, so uh, on a baseline level, uh, we can confidently say that we can group uh, these tuna steaks into low, medium, and high histamine levels, um, and, but we are getting very strong correlations. Uh, and so with uh, a, a little extra effort, we can uh, probably measure the histamine levels in tuna uh, quite accurately. If you've taken near range, if you had taken near range 900 to 1700 nanometers, would the result of regression been better? Again, that, that's very hard to, to speculate. Um, there's a chance that it could have been better, um, but I guess I'll say that these results in the Venier spectral range were pretty darn good. Um, and so uh, usually uh, if the results in the Venier are good enough. Um, there's often not uh, 
a high motivation to move to the near because of course the near is a, a slightly higher price point the detector technology is a bit more expensive so if you can accomplish something in the v near uh, usually you uh, prefer that um, uh, also uh, we were highly confident that we'd be able to correlate the um, the visible spectra to the histamine level um, so there's a chance that it, it would not be better um, so uh, we would need to do that uh, test in order to find out for sure. What is the power of the light source? Uh, so our standard light source uses a 150 watt um, quartz tungsten halogen bulb uh, focused down to a line using an aluminum reflector. Um, I, I, I would need to uh, look into exactly what light source was used for this particular set of data, um, but it, was, uh, it would have been something uh, on the order of uh, the power of that light source. Why is the histamine classification so speckled? I think I can take this one, uh, Will. So this is a nice, uh, this is a great question because it helps uh, show the differences between the, the, the many different applications that you can use the per class Vera software for. When we were looking at the um, RGB classification images of the tuna steaks themselves, uh, what, what we were looking at initially was the pixel by pixel, pixel classification. And those images were rather speckled. But then we switched to the objects view. It was looking for, again, the contiguous region of the same classification of just tuna steak. And that's why those images were uh, contiguous. But here in the regression model of the per class mirror software is, again, doing similar to that classification of just each pixel. It's going pixel by pixel, making a decision on the regression, uh, which is why, why it's uh, particularly speckled. Uh, and it's also probably a, a good indicator that uh, of the, the quality of the model as well, considering that the, the histamine distribution on the stake is, is not uniform, uh, as Will mentioned before. Regarding model deployment, the hyperspectral data is of high dimension. How to process real-time hyperspectral data? Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that question. So the way that uh, the software works is uh, every time we get a frame of data that's a spatial spectral frame uh, the model will process that spatial spectral frame and reduce it down uh, to the classification values um, and as the uh, tuna or uh, as the scene continues um, down the line when an object is finished it will uh, use the, the buffered data um, to assign a regression value to the full object. So all of this uh, can happen um, as, uh, um, as fast as the frame rate of the sensor in most cases. Um, and so uh, per class Mira is very powerful in that it can create these um, uh, classification and regression models uh, that a given proper computing power, so usually we're using GPUs in the background uh, and a fair amount of horsepower on our computers to get it done, um, but we can uh, process a full frame of data um, generally about as fast as you can acquire data in the hyperspectral imager. So we can reduce the dimensionality and uh, produce a result in real time. And, and usually that uh, the standard result um, say for uh, the tuna would be what we would call an object table. Um, and so while we can output a, an image like this or a classification image, uh, we would often just output a, a table that gives you the location of the object and in this case its regression value. Um, and so that would contain all of the actual information you need to make a decision or uh, to command a robot. Um, and uh, it reduces the data stream uh, uh, by a lot. And, and again, this can all happen in real time. Uh, and any more precise answer than that would again uh, depend on your uh, precise model and application needs. Uh, and we're of course very happy to work with anybody um, on developing a specific application. Can you share example spectra that were used to measure the histamine level? Um, I, I don't have those uh, available right now, 
Um, but we could look into making some of these uh, data cubes publicly available. Uh, so the the way this again what this this was done all in per class Mira, and so the the data cubes were loaded into the software package. The training was done, and then per class Mira pulled um, uh, uh, spectra from all of the trained objects in order to uh, train the regression model. Um, and so uh, I, I could provide the data cubes that were used to generate uh, uh, the model, and uh, I could possibly provide the, the per class Mira uh, project file as well if you wanted to uh, uh, peruse the, the project file that was used. Uh, of course, you would need either a license or a trial license of per class Mira to, to browse uh, that project file. Uh, and again, if that is something that interests you, uh, please either uh, contact Headwall or Perclass uh, to, to get a trial license or to request that data. Thank you, everybody, for such great questions. We'd just like to let you know that coming up, the Seafood Expo Global in Barcelona is April 25th to 27th at the Fira Barcelona Gran Via venue in Spain. This is the world's largest seafood trade event. Buyers, suppliers, media, and other seafood professionals from more than 160 countries attend. And you can visit us at booth 3QQ02. And thank you so much for attending. We'd like to thank our presenters, Will Rock and George Killian, again. And I hope everybody has a fantastic day.